but at the right. end, yeah. when yeah. you see when he plays, I mean, yeah, in that championship yeah. game, it's, yeah. then you love him. Yeah. You're like, wow, this does guy's... it seem like he's not? Oh, that was very cool. Yeah, I does it seem like that, he's not, not living right, uh, yes. commensurate with the money that he's making? Oh yes, he is. You see his house. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. You didn't get to the Dude, new house. No, no, no. Google oh, his house okay. right now. It's a, it's I didn't watch the whole series. I just they watched... build a new house yeah, towards massive. the end of the quarterbacks. Because yeah. what is his contract? $500 million? Yeah. He yeah. should have a bigger house is all I'm saying. Dude, he just built uh, it. Where's Catalina? Is that where, halfway? It's right next to Silver Point. Atlantic Beach. Someone's going to take Silver Point, that whole area? Yeah, it's, that's the end. What is Silver Point? They're going to make that. National County is going to sell that, and a developer is going to build like 20 like Hampton house house and make a zillion dollars. They should. Did you see the article in the post about oh, yeah. uh, Atlantic Beach? Was that funny to you when you saw it? You know, that's, that's Seth. Wow. Seth has a big house there. Atlantic Beach is nice, but there's no restaurants. There's nothing there. There's one beginnings. There's nothing you gotta, there. You have to bring your food. You know, yeah. somebody, somebody, that, somebody that grew up there told me in response to that article, said, you know, there's no gas station. So what do you mean? He said, they True. want, they want you in and out. They don't want anyone hanging around. There's yeah. no convenience stores. There's no gas station. There's not even, there's not even a gas station at West, in West Long Beach. Right, but they don't want people coming to Atlantic Beach and hanging out. I agree. You know they did? During, when they had all the protests, they raised the bridge. Yeah, I, I could see that. I could see that. All right, uh, guys, how are we doing? Uh, close. Just a minute. Okay. So, um, how long do you stay up here for the summer? You're, we're all over the place. Okay. You're in the city a lot while no, you're up here? a couple of days. You don't have that much to do here, right? We have an office, but I hate it. I hate this city. It's annoying. <laughs> I hate this city. That's why I'm never here. It's the worst. Why we don't be here? <laughs> you know? Joe's, Joe's in. I hate fucking hate this city. <laughs> really? It's a joke. Yeah. Where did your office used to be? Were you uh, all the way we're, downtown? Yeah, we're in the World Financial Center. In the, so now we're in the water yeah. over there? Okay. And now we're at uh, 120 Broadway. John. Yes. Is this better? But you did the city five days a week oh, for your whole yeah, career, no? Yeah, until about yeah. 15, 15 yeah. years ago. That was fun. Limo rides with Oscar. Remember Oscar? Limo rides with Oscar. Then we lost the we lost it in the World Trade Center. The first World Trade Center bro. Uh, so what do all those people do out there? Work. Work. It's all part of the RIA. <laughs> Traders, financial advisors, compliance. We're doing mock audit today. We have a mock audit going on with compliance. So an, our outside auditing firm is sitting with our CCO and just going through what we're doing. Uh, I have traders out here. I have uh, traders, financial planners. Uh, every, you know, Not traders like you think of traders. Not, tra not prop traders. Yeah. Traders, ex execution brokers. traders. No brokers. No brokers. We're not. We're not. Uh, we're not Series Seven. We're not Finra. We're all advisory. So no, no brokers. So you get paid on wrap fees, only, <laughs> only fee based. So, but it's not deductible, right? Deductible from what? Not anymore. Not anymore. No, no, no. Not deductible. No. Oh, they changed. Yeah, they no, used to be. <laughs> Ready to go? Wait. <laughs> Just let those two guys in when they come. Whenever they get here. All right. John, welcome back. What show is this? Episode 104. Today's show, it's a compound of friends. It's brought to you by bird dogs. It's summer. It's bird dog season. I'm rocking bird dogs all over the place, Duncan. I gotta tell you. At the beach, not at the beach, everywhere. These they've got these like khaki shorts, they're stretched. You ever hear of a company called Lululemon? Bird Dogs is better and more affordable. I stand by that, not just because they're sponsoring the show. I also got this sick dad hat. What, what are we calling this, this material? Nylon. Nylon? Yeah. It breathes. Looks nice. Looks good, feels good. Uh, if you want your own dad hat, I'm calling it a Michael dad hat, go to birddogs.com slash compound and enter promo code compound for a free white tech dad hat. Oh, it's a white tech dad hat. Okay, that works. Again, that's birddogs.com slash compound. Welcome to the Compound and Friends episode number 104. My name is Downtown Josh Brown, and we have a very special show for you. John is back from his vacation. Duncan is here. Duncan, say hello. Hello, everyone. Nicole is here. Rob is here. And two very special guests. But first... 
my co-host Michael Batnick. Michael, say hello to everyone. Hello, hello. All right. You want to do the intros today? You want me to Go do ahead. it? I don't have a doc open. Okay. Uh, returning to the show. Joe, how many times have you been on the show? Twice? Not enough. Not enough times. That's true. One Sorry, virtual, true. one in answer. studio. All right. Everybody loves uh, Joe Terranova. Joe is the chief market strategist and senior managing director for Virtus Investment Partners. Joe, remind everybody, Virtus is uh, one of the largest asset management firms in the country, publicly traded. Correct. Uh, how long have you been there? 2008. Okay. 165 billion AUM. Ticker symbol VRTS. 165 billion AUM? 165 billion they should just, AUM. They should just let you trade that. They should just let you whip that around <laughs> a few weeks. Right? Ridiculously undervalued. Like in, uh, only in earnings season, right? Right. All right. Uh, Mark Fisher is here. Mark has not been on this show before. Mark is a living legend. Do people call you that? You are, though, a little bit. Well, it's good that he's I'm living, living, but I'm not a legend. No, no, no. <laughs> Mark is a living legend to me. Uh, Mark is the founder and CEO of MBF Trading, which is an independent energy trader. And you've been trading 40 years. Is that is that right? Is it that long? No, more. More than 40 years. When did, you, when did you start trading? Very kind I started of working when I was 13. So 13? Guess, yes. I started okay. trading when I was 18 for my grandfather, 21 for myself. So it's 40-something years. And you've always been trading for yourself? Yeah. Or Never worked for anybody. Never? Never. Okay. You started with your bar mitzvah money? No, I started with the money I got paid from my first boss when I was 14. Well, What was that? What was the first job when you were 14? What were you doing? So my neighbor, that, my neighbor, I kept seeing him come home with nicer and nicer cars. I banged on his door, and he turned out to be the broker for the hunts in silver. Oh, so you got so you traded commodities for S silver? Yeah, so, so I trade, that was it. That's you like did. a Wolf of Wall Street where Joe and Hill goes, "You make how much? I'll quit my job right now." Well, I was, I, but I was in school. I went to a Jewish day school. I, while I was in school, I was doing that. Then I was supposed to go to Brown Six Med School. Said, "What am I going to kill somebody?" Went to Wharton. Was in the five year submatric program. Uh, had a good friend of mine who took the notes. I just kept the last two years and just took all the tests, and that was it. So when you start when you started trading, uh, what were you? Did you start on the Nymex? Do I no, have that Comex. right? Comex. Comex. Okay. What's the difference between the Comex and the Nymex for people that don't know? Comex is where all the metals trade: silver, gold, copper. Okay. Nymex is where all the oil trade. Okay. And but you, at some point you moved from one to the other. Right. Okay. Why did you Why did you switch from one to the other? More opportunity. So say more. Oil, oil was just a much bigger market. Okay. You know? What what year is this? Is this eighties already or no? Early nineties, early nineties. But so how do you get started with metals? Like why not stocks or anything else? Because my boss, he was you know he was on the Comex floor and that's where I started, you know, and that's where you know silver was oh, silver. That's where we started. A lot of people that are in the industry now yeah. started on Comex that you wouldn't yeah you, you wouldn't really think of really yeah, yeah. ready yeah. On the on the commodities exchange floor, there was four exchanges: COMEX, NYMEX, cotton, and sugar. Right on that floor, that's where Paul Jones started. That's okay. where Lewis Bacon started. Monsters, um, monsters. Uh, Gary Cohn. Gary Cohn. Was it Lloyd Blankfein? Was a commodities trader also, but for Goldman. But they were upstairs. Yeah. They were up, That was J. Aaron. Uh, Those are upstairs guys. Yeah, that yeah. was J. Aaron. That was the commodities song. Okay. Did trading? Did trading metals to start your career? Uh, teach you things that you would not have otherwise learned had you started in bonds or stocks or anywhere else? Because silver back then was the most volatile thing that were around. It's like, do you want to start at a table where it's, you know, no limit? That's basically where you started. Yeah. And the instant day volatility made, you know, it was like... So if you didn't risk manage, you could lose your career in a day. Basically. If you didn't risk manage, you did lose your career in a day. Yeah. So you're trading futures for yourself. Yes. I was one of the largest locals in the silver pit. And then I migrated over to trade or energy. But if you didn't manage yourself, you were dead. So who's on the other side of your trades back then? Who the hell the, I don't know. Funds, brokers, everybody. But but again, it was learning how to, you know, it's like it's like learning how to manage a chip stack. It's really no different than playing poker to some degree. So what do you what do you think your what do you think your edge was where you kept going while a lot of other people washed out? Was it the the risk management or was there something else? <sighs> risk management. Discipline, luck. And when I was in college, I developed a trading model that we still basically use today that, you know, all my guys use that we started out with called ACD. And we basically blew that up. And that's what we use also. But there's not a lot of uh, inputs into trading like metals market in terms of like fundamentals, right? Is it mostly price or is it news flow? Like what drives prices? I'm sure there's a lot of fundamentals. But the problem is with fundamentals is whatever someone, in the you know, on the floor would know about it, it'd be seeing the next paper five days later. Right. 
So what's the point? Okay, so you so you end up meeting Joe, and this is this is the story I want to start off with. I've known Joe. Joe is like a little bit of a mentor to me, and I've told him this. He's like a big brother to me. Joe has been looking out for me since we first met. We had a lot in common, both from Long Island, both ridiculously handsome. Um, <laughs> no, but we 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 vibe. We like a lot of the same people. We I think we think the same about markets, yep. the behavioral side. Uh, and and focus on the way people act versus what they say. So we have a lot of that in common. And I always reference him as somebody that's been like a mentor to me, but he always references you. So the story I want to start with, and, and Joe, will, Joe will always say, I learned this from Mark, or Mark told me that for the first time. So he looks up to you in the way that I look up to him. So that's where I want to, That's you got his Pepsi? Yeah. We, bring in the Pepsi. <laughs> bring in the Pepsi. <laughs> Good man, good man. Guys, just stay right there. So, so, yeah, you guys can hang. So that's so that's that's where I want to start. Who wants to tell me the story of how you guys met, started working together? Okay, Joe. Joe, so, Joe will do it. So, um, I went to Shamanad High School. Got out of Shamanad High School. If we're starting, my this dad, no, 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 we're never gonna get done. We'll be here for two years. <laughs> so my my dad basically said to me, "Why are you sending in applications to prestigious schools? You're wasting money. I can't afford to send you there. We have one car. You and your sister have to go to St. Okay, Jones not Jewish. Can we just <laughs> totally. let's start? Let's right. start. Valley okay. Stream, Long Island. Okay, okay, let's start there. So I go to St. John's University. Come out of college. I'm Italian from St. John's University. I go to J.P. Morgan. What do they immediately say? How the, long is this show? We're going to be at two hours. The back door two, entrance. The back door entrance is that way. Okay. okay. St. John's, tie-in kid, you're not going in the front door. So I worked at JP Morgan. I worked at Swiss Banking Corp. Wait, what uh, does that mean, the back door? Is that metaphorical? Like, what are you talking about? It just, you don't have the opportunities that someone from a prestigious university. Your name's not Chet. Right. Right. So Chet. You didn't, Chet. You didn't Chet. row. Chet. Okay. So I go to Swiss Banking Corp. And unfortunately, uh, we did well on the trading desk. We make like $6 million a year. and We get a $3,000 bonus at the end of the year. I'm like, that math doesn't end up. So I left. I quit. Yeah. I ended up going t into the five towns. There was a physical fitness studio. Mark was one of the clients. Okay. Me along with three other guys that I was friends with from the five towns. They knew nothing about working out. I did. I was an athlete. I met Mark in the gym, started working out with Mark. And Mark looks confused. That's not how he remembers it. Keep going. Because I didn't work out. <laughs> I, 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 I jlub around. And out. we, we, we kind of hit it off and he invited me down to the floor and the rest of it's a story, I think, right? What did you see in, what did you see in Joe that made you think, let me get this guy out of the gym and show him what I do? So one of the things that I can do is I can tell within 10 minutes if someone can make a trade or not. Really? Yeah. Without even watching them trade, just watching what? No. What are you watching? There's four steps to the decision-making process. Collecting data, analyzing, deciding, implementing. If you're good at that four steps, right, and you're quick about it, you can make it. For instance, I always tell you the story of I had two guys work for me. One guy was a graduate of Harvard Law School, graduated second in his class, and another guy was an, was an ice cream truck driver in Lang Beach. And the ice cream truck driver, I saw 50 kids go up to him and go, I want this, this, and he would just keep track of everybody. And make every at the same time, who ended up being who ended up making fifty million dollars trading commodities? <laughs> the ice cream man, ice cream man, not okay. the Harvard trade. Yeah, and I saw that Joe had that same process. The difference between a trader and a doctor is if you do this process as a trader and you get good at it, okay, the worst you do is you lose money. If you do this process too fast, it's like, you, know, you need to kill somebody. Yeah. So obviously it's a different thing, but I can recognize people that can actually have that skill set. And that skill set is the most important thing to do. In, or to be so, I mean, it sounds like it boils down to like, I don't want to say the word hustle because that cheapens no, it. No, no. But it sounds like somebody who is, it's almost like hand-eye coordination, but keeping organized mentally and remembering things that just happened two seconds ago and doing things in the right order. I like to say, are you the point guard or are you the power forward? The power forward is not making a trading. The point guard is. But what about personality? Because a lot of this game is mental. Obviously, you need to be able to think and analyze, but sometimes you're your own worst enemy. Everyone's their own worst enemy. That's the whole thing, you know? If you see a guy every Monday morning come in, we used to have people come in Monday, huh. first morning, and lose money every Monday morning. And then I would go to them, when are you getting divorced? It's all about how well you can manage yourself and how well you can manage, you know, your life. The problem with trading, for, for you know, like I have guys, the problem with trading, even today, is unlike a business that you guys grow, when you trade the amount that we trade, 
and you're making and losing insane amount of money in a couple of minutes. Think about when Josh goes to a store. I can't remember what it is. There's one shirt that's eighty dollars, another shirt that might maybe Josh, one hundred eighty, two hundred. I mean, because he doesn't buy eighty dollars shirts anymore. But back then, eighty or fifty eight, you know, that's real money. Except when you're trading, you're making and losing thousands of dollars in seconds. You're going, what that? You know, what? Where do I care? You know, the, the mind takes over and says, what's $22? I just lost $22,000 in 30 seconds. That's the biggest hang up with traders. How you manage. Oh, you're saying they think about dollars at risk in a trading account. They they conflate those with like their own money. They don't do it on purpose. They do no, it I know. They do it's hard, it's hard not to. I think yeah. you lose the value of of a dollar when you see the the amount of money that's made or lost on a trading floor in a given day. What's no, it's, a, it's not in a given day, in a given second. It's not that, I mean, there are hundreds of businesses that you make a significant amount more money, but there's very few businesses where you make or lose it so quickly. Well, you know what? It seems like all the big blowups seem to happen in the futures market because of what? Leverage? Like you don't hear about equity hedge funds blowing up. At, like, yeah, you do. I mean, you do, no, but, you but, have- but to zero, like quickly, like natural gas traders, for example, it feels like it always happens in the futures markets. I, I think that's a generalization. I think you, you may hear about, but there's been a lot of blowups in, in hedge funds too. And there's been a lot, of, look at all the bank blowups. Look at, you know, again, you hear about it, you know, but it, if the hardest thing for a trader to do is risk manage himself. That's why, for myself, when I trade, I don't execute myself. I have someone execute for me. Otherwise, I'd be like this all day. Well, what, if, what does risk management mean, like, to you? To me? Yeah. Number one, making sure, where am I getting out if I'm wrong? If I have no idea where I'm getting out, I'm not getting in, okay? Why am I making the trade, right? Uh, what's the probability of success, right? You know, how many trades am I making just because I'm bored versus how many trades I'm making because of the real trades, right? Um is everyone else thinking the same way I am? If everyone else is thinking the same way, I'm not doing it. It sounds like it requires a lot of self-awareness and you almost have to like psychoanalyze your own actions through, during the course of the day yeah. to like catch yourself and say, wait, why am I doing this trade? Right. Um, how many How many years can you do that before either you figure out, okay, I do belong doing this or it like drives you crazy? Like it, it's, it would seem like most people are not cut out for that level of self-reflection every day, but it's like required because you're taking risk. The problem is that with traders, you could I could usually tell within six months whether someone's made an effort, but the problem is that things happen. They get married. Was it the right person? Then they have a child, that whole thing. Then they buy a house. Then someone significant to them, a father, mother passes away, or there's another thing. All these different things impact them in a lot of ways. They, they won't tell you. You know, that a dog dies. Weird things happen and it affects people in the way they, they operate. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've been to that traded with me that I've been to the psychiatrist with. Yeah. What are some signs that things are going wrong in their personal life? It's like, like over trading, for example? Yeah. Trading just because they're letting out their frustration in their own lives or boredom, as the case may be. Right. Their own lives. So the way that you run MBF now, tell tell the audience a little bit about the structure of the firm and who, like, what kind of trading that you're doing and how you're overseeing it. Now it's easier because it's all on the computer, right? Okay. Right, and we have uh, like uh, thirty something traders, right? And it ma- it's managed the same way. So some degree, it's easier because it's all computerized. When Joe is in risk management, think about the trading pits. Yeah. Right? So we ran two businesses back there. One was the traders in the pits, and two, I was the insurance of the clearing firm for a lot of the trades that we didn't do, right? That was the greatest business because if I wouldn't show your trades and I got a little smidgen every time, I was you know I was like the house without doing anything, right? Right. But in terms of managing back then when it wasn't computerized, who knew what was going on, yeah. right? And so you'd always be delayed. So, you know, be, it'd be putting out like Joe well, was like a fireman. You were doing P&L like by hand. It was crazy. The day. Yep. And then you wouldn't even it's know crazy. if it, it would, and then people would hide their P&Ls and hide <laughs> trades. <laughs> Oh, you, good you, you would find out there was a trade? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was craziness, right? But now it's much easier to do it. So you've got, you've got 30 traders. Are the, is this their money, your money? How does this work? Investors' money? No, no investors. It's either my money or their money, but no no outside partners. No, it's, it's just us. Okay. Yeah. How come? Because you don't, we don't need it. Okay. We trade big enough. To, we trade as big as the market is. Well, why would it, first of all, number one, I don't want to answer anybody else. Number two, we don't need anyone else's money. If there's an opportunity, whether it's X, there's a position limit. We're going to trade to the limit we have to trade. So do you see yourself as kind of a player coach 
Uh, you have traders there. I'm a player coach. Okay, so you're yeah. trading, but then also they're probably coming to you and, and right, but I, asking but, but what but you I think. But trade, I trade less. You know, I, I, I now, uh, you know, I have an eight-year-old who drives me crazy. So like, you know, yeah, yeah. You, know, it's, you know, I'm 62. Yeah. But the thing is, it keeps you young. You know, everyone says my eight-year-old keeps me young. My two things that keep me young is my eight-year-old and trading. And your 30 traders. <laughs> right. Also. And the whole thing. You know? right. So if, if, there's obviously a baseline of intelligence that everybody needs to have to work for you. Yes. But aside from that, just personality, how important is that? No. Versus the, see, versus the intelligence. Know, I'd rather take someone who doesn't know anything. Because someone comes in with a bias, it's impossible to break them of it. Mm -hmm. Right? It's much easier to take someone who knows nothing and mold them than to take someone who thinks he knows everything. So if somebody comes to you and they were a sell-side analyst covering oil stocks for not 10 ha years. Not happen. <laughs> right, because then That's everything not, that they think they know, they know is going to infect what they're doing on, right. on, the, on the market right. that day. And the amount of information they think they have, like, you know what I'm trying to say? That's if, you, if you think about it, the futures market is the one market that hasn't traditionalized itself. How so? Why is that? Well, is it is it is it something that a retail investor is able to access in a product or, or, or they shouldn't? They shouldn't. You know why? Because the discipline that is required, the discipline is the common denominator. Forget about the intellect. If you don't have the discipline and the extreme discipline that's needed, you have zero chance in terms of being successful. Zero. So whenever whenever you hear traders talk about discipline, mm -hmm. a lot of times in the next breath. They'll talk about somebody that just 10X'd in something. Can you have discipline and swing for the fences uh, and and have those types of home run trades? Or are those two things like mutually exclusive and one that has nothing to do with the other? No, we've had not go well, we've had some I trades that have gone from, to home run trades, but when you start out with a single that you want to make into a double, and then you see it in second base and you see it go and you just let it go. Right? That's okay. happened to us. Yeah. It happened to us in power, it happened to us in it happened to, it, you know, get, has happened all the time. So you're not setting out for that. You're not setting out to swing for a home run. Okay. So, so Mark showed me a video the other night that's that's remarkable. He he eloquently described what it takes to be a trader, and within that, he talked about volatility. So most people think of volatility. I know in the in you know in the wealth management industry, everyone thinks of volatility, and that's when that's something to be hedged. You, you get right. the emotional imbalance and people start doing the wrong things in their portfolio. Yeah. The way he thinks about volatility is it's opportunity. He thinks of the volatility. Sure. He says, okay, this is when we increase our size limit, right? Right. Okay. Um, and so so you're so you're running the show. You've got 30 traders. Do they all trade the same things? No. Or so some people are specializing in one thing versus right. another. Yeah. And okay. we try to find I mean, now we're trying to find people that specialize in things where you know different things that we don't trade right now. Is okay. it all futures? 90%. Okay. Can we talk about oil prices and energy stocks this year? Go. What Here do you think? <laughs> oil prices? Well, let's start Let's start with this. Let's last year, want. last year, energy stocks were like the only bright spot in the S&P. Mm -hmm. uh, oil prices went crazy during the invasion, obviously, in Eastern Europe. Uh, they stayed up for most of the year, and every publicly traded energy company was able to come in with huge earnings gains because it was year over year versus 21, right. which was horrible. Okay, so that came and went, and a lot of money was made. Uh, this year, it hasn't been as easy. Energy, I think, is negative on the year, 1% or so, as a sector of stocks. Uh, uh, crude, crude is, is back at the April, toward the, close to the April highs, high 70s. How do you see huh. the setup from here, um, given everything that we've gone through in the last couple of years? I don't know anything about stocks. Good. Okay. You know what you know, okay? But in futures, it's been buy it at 65, sell it at 85. It's a range. It's a range. Okay. And now with Saudi Arabia, you know, flexing their wings, maybe it goes 70 bit at 90. Okay. Right? right? Except for that doesn't mean what happens to the products. It means heating oil, gasoline, distillate. Like distillate's been on a big, you know, you know, gas has been a big move lately. Because the refined products can go anywhere because of lack of refinery capacity, right? But the underlying product, you know, 70 bit at 90 maybe now. It was, so, the be, floor, so the floor is moving up. Yeah. Okay. Floor, because because you could tell Saudi is making the floor move up. Okay. You know? Are, and, they, and are it, they as powerful as, as that? More where powerful. They're more powerful. More powerful. So they decide where the floor is going to be. No, they, 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 you know, you can just see them more, they're more powerful. And look, we, the U.S. has run out of bullets, right? We, we, we've depleted the SPR, right? We've tried to talk Saudi down. I mean, there's a couple of black swans. Obviously, if there's a, a deal between Saudi... United States and Israel, you know, the whole thing, the maybe part of it is, you know, they banned oil for a little while in terms of that whole deal. If Saudi gets, you know, the 
the NATO type protections, maybe that we call, you know, be, but, you know, there's another, you know, if there's an Israel-Iran conflict, you know, all all bets are off. But in terms of, it's, you know, it's 70 bit at 90, 65 bit at 85, but the, but the, in the, the individual products, the refined products can go anywhere. Heating oil has been on a tear, right? Every, and again, but to trading it, you got to know, except for, except for the intraday day trading, where's the market? Right now, everyone's back to being bullish. You know, you go back two months ago, everyone thought oil, you know. It's amazing how price will do that. How do you incorporate sentiment into your overall that's analysis? What that's the best thing. That's the whole thing? Yeah. To me, I, I, read, every, I, I read everything. I read like, yeah, this sounds crazy, but I read like 10,000 pages a week. Okay? And if What and, are you reading? What does that mean? I read everybody. Okay? And I don't want to go into who everybody is, but everything. And I want to have a view that's different than everybody. So below 70, everybody was like, this is the end of the world. Right now, everyone's now the New York Times is against, you know, it's back to, you know, banging the paper. Everyone's negative on natural gas. Everybody thinks that this winter is going to be terrible. Nobody's long. The right? winter's going to be terrible, meaning it's not going to be cold enough. No, they, uh, that there's, you know, there's going to be too much supply, yada, yada, yada. But, and again, that may be the case, but between now and let's say a month from now or three weeks from now, right? When people have to, when the index funds have to basically roll to the winter and there's no natural seller. My bet is the price is going to go up. So that's what gets you excited when everybody thinks one thing. And they might be right, but oftentimes the, the, right. often the price is already reflecting that. Or, or, yeah, or the fact that they're not thinking. I have to think differently. You know? So you, so the trades might be shorter term, but you seem to have a longer term view uh, directionally. Or you just have a, a sense of how far to one side the consensus is. And how far. It's a bet. Like, you know, sometimes you make, like in a poker hand, you may play the hand, you may lose, but if, 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 it, was, if it was three to one in your favor and you're going to risk X, you're going to make the trade, right? right? So you I, might say maybe the market's right, but so what? I'm going to bet against it because if I'm right, the right. payoff is big enough that right. it's worth the it's risk. It's all expected value. Okay. Right? So you can do that without being bullish or bearish per se. Yes. Okay. And commodities, there's more statistical evidence that you could rely on. So there's a commitment of traders report. There's open interest statistics, which I know you look at. You, you know, so think about it. Think about if you know you had open interest on an equity. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to grab that type of sentiment. Back in the day, um, we used to look at something. Remember the DSI, yeah, the daily sentiment indicator, which would tell you what percentage of uh, individuals and traders that are looking at oil are bullish or bearish. So bullish would be above 90. And you would, we would actually have DSI trades. You could measure sentiment a lot easier so in that, commodities. that sort of stuff is really important because I always say with, with stocks, like you don't necessarily know the odds, right? Well, if you're betting on the Nuggets to win the finals this year because you think they're the best team, well, they're the favorite. You're, you're not going to get compensated for that sort of risk. In the stock market, you don't necessarily see the odds. You might have sentiment, anecdotal sort of things. But with what you're talking about, there is a way to sort of quantify where yeah. everybody is. Yep. That's what I do. Perfect example. This past, I mean, you talk about, what did you say, the Nuggets? Nuggets. Before the season started, right? I bet the Orioles at 125 to 1 to win the World Series. People say, you're throwing out your money. Okay, maybe I was, but I knew they weren't 125 to 1. Now they're 18 to 1. Yeah. Right? It's a, right. Right. It's it's a, a, it's a long thing. shot that nobody's no, nobody else. I, I, bet, I bet on the Heat to beat the Celtics, not because I thought they were going to, but they were plus like three sixty. Right. But the thing about the thing about trading is you you have to be like become the house where you have to bet small enough, so that if you go through a bad streak, you're not going to lose all your chips. But you have to bet big enough that it matters. Right. That's have, the hard part. You have to manage your chip stack. Right. And people don't do that. When something geopolitical happens, it's rarely out of nowhere. Probably for you because you're reading so much. Right. But it does catch the market you know, uh, by surprise, because most people are not focused on, for example, troops amassing around the border of Ukraine. Right. But I know people in the energy space know that that's going on and they know a lot right. of detail. So when something like that comes along, you almost have to now have a view on how long this conflict might last, how bad might it get? What does it do to supply of natural gas? What does it mean, right? So being a, a participant in that market you have to be a fairly worldly person and a generalist. Like you have to understand a, lo a lot or a little about a lot of things. Right. Is that a good way to put it? Yes, but you also have to know what you know and know what you don't know. Okay. The problem is that everyone thinks they know everything, right? When you okay. Know everything, right? So you can't think you're George Soros no, in that moment, the, the, but you have to know what's going on. Right. Like to me, the I mean, and I'm probably going to be wrong, but the easiest trade is to be along with the agricultural acts, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, three reasons. One. Russia, if they shut off the Ukrainian last last port, that's a, that's going to be a debacle. Two, right? We're not growing anymore. There's no more farmland, right? Three, uh, if Africa wants to raise that level of of um, wealth, you're going to do it through protein, which is grains. Four, 
You know the biggest owner? Who's the largest landowner of farmland in the United States? You should know this, Josh. Is it Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Okay. Right? Bill Gates is buying farmland. You want to go against him? Right. It's like going against Warren Buffett and Oxy, right? I mean, I don't know anything about but right. He's buying why is he buying farmland? So directionally, you think right. you think the the, the ags have You have to you know, and, and not think about that. You don't want to be betting against them for a long period right. of time. And, and, and India is now restricting exports of right. rice. And, and, of rice. The last couple and, of I think about something else. Whenever oil goes up too much, although oil's really, if you look at it over the 10 year thing, it's really in real terms, it's down 30% because the price is going anywhere. You know, everyone goes that bullet blames OPEC. Yeah. Who are you gonna blame for corn going up? Well, there's no OPEC of there's corn. No OPEC there's of nobody, corn. right? What are you going to farm it? Orville Redenbacher. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, can we put this crude oil chart up real quick? Sure. Okay. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at WTI. I guess this is one year. Um, this has been a tough trade in a bull market. If you think about it, last October stocks bottomed. Uh, we've been straight up in the Nasdaq ever since, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of. Got a lot of stock sectors working since then, pretty much everything other than energy. And wow. now all of a sudden, crude is back up at that resistance level from the spring. A lot of trap. I don't, who knows? I can tell you, I, I, here, but as a bet, whenever the Fed decides to stop raising rates, right, and says we're going to, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to go down, whatever, I, I would probably tell you that these commodities are going to go through the roof. Why? Because it's it, it, it's a natural bet for me, right? Because all they've done is sort of like this interest rate rise has been put a Band-Aid on a wound. The minute they put it off, inflation is going to come right back, right? I'd also probably bet that for, within 48 hours from the time they stop raising rates, that's when the market's going to top out. It's all it's all countercyclical. You know the thing. Whatever makes sense never makes money. If it right. made sense... Then everyone at Harvard would it's be a so multi ob- It's so obvious. I do all these segments on television and the hosts, the hosts and a lot of the guests, it's always like uh it's like a bullish catalyst that the Fed's gonna start cutting rates at some point or stop raising rates. And it's like, are you sure about that? Because what would have to be going on for the Fed to be cutting rates all of a sudden? It's probably not gonna be great. So all right, so so you think um so so if you had to guess though, the second half of this year you think could be more uh, constructive than the first half for, right. for oil, gas, or not I don't, necessarily. I don't, 65 bit at 85, 70 bit at 90 and crude. Products could go anywhere. Okay. Because there's no new refineries. Right. Yeah. So th- what happens to products depends on what happens in different things. So you're trading all the oil products, not just. Yeah, we trade everything natural gas and. John, and, next and, chart. Everything. This is natural gas. This one's surprising to me. Why? I don't know. I, I, I guess I can't believe how cheap natural gas is relative to everything else that seems but so expensive all, it's all, right now. It's supply. You know, think about what happened in, 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 in Europe. They had a warm winter. Okay. Do, you know where, do you know where natural gas was, um, uh, TTF was? It was 10, it was 10 bucks. 10 bucks. I'm, I'm saying la- uh, a year ago. Where was European, European natural gas. gas last winter? It was oh, like 40. Oh, European natural yeah. gas, way higher. Okay, give yeah. me a number. What was it? Uh, 40? 35. What? 35? What? I don't know. You Keep tell going. Me. Higher. <laughs> Come on. 55. Come. You're not even the ballpark. <laughs> All right, give it to me. What is it? It's over 120. At one was point. it really? Yeah. Okay. And now it, it collapsed, right? That, it, and and U.S. natural gas prices were what? 10. Yeah. And then, you're right. But, but, and everyone thinks that, you know, the reason why this year is going to happen because there's no new LNG facilities being built yet that, that have come online. We have extra supply, right? The whole thing with, uh, what was it? Freeport, mm-hmm. right? That whole when they shut that down, yeah. this is a whole other thing. That's a, I have a conspiracy theory about Freeport, but I won't say that on air because Freeport, Freeport, yeah. When they shut down the Freeport, you know, um, not Freeport, Long Island, no, Freeport, Freeport, not Freeport Long Island, <laughs> no, 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 Free, Freeport, the uh, LNG thing, yeah. What's the conspiracy? No, okay, <laughs> okay. Wait, I, what? What? What was? What was going through your brain when when oil went negative? Did you think that could ever happen? Yeah. Why? Because the CB told you it could happen two weeks before that. What did they say? They said the prices could go negative. I mean, if someone tells you it could go negative, <laughs> sort of like someone says, you can maybe go, out, you, know, you know, right? Can natural gas go negative? Yes, it has gone negative. In different bi- basis locations, natural gas has gone negative in different places all the time when, when it gets, uh, c- when the when supply gets constrained, different other trading hubs. When, so- when, when it goes negative, I mean, it, literally, is it what it says it is people are paying to get rid of it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about this. Yeah. Sugar. Sugar. We bought, I bought sugar one day. This He was with me, right? This yeah. is just a, we're in the sugar pit, which is a whole other, you could write a story about the sugar pit, right, Joe? You could. I, what I, year was this? I, who the hell knows? Okay. <laughs> we're in the sugar pit. 
And this is when the expiration of one of the contract months, it was January sugar, which was an off month. And sugar was trading like uh, two cents, 200 points. Let's call it 200. And someone had contracts to sell. And it was the last day. And he can't find the buyer. I said, screw it. I'm going to buy it. Right? He sold me sugar at one tick. <laughs> okay? So Joe says, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm going to buy the sugar one tick. He says, what are you going to do with this? I don't give a shit. The bags have to be worth more than a tick. Forget the sugar. The bag has to be worth more than a tick, right? And someone bought it from me a penny. And that was the start of the bull market. Sugar went from there to 25 cents. Things happen for crazy reasons, right? You know, know, one of the things, just real quick on crude oil, that everyone has to think about when you look forward, and I say this all the time when I meet with uh, financial advisors, is the increase in domestic production of oil happened. Why? Because the cost of capital was zero. Yeah, I was going to say fr- uh, fracking, cheap, cheap, uh, cheap so money. So all those wells were funded yeah. with free money. Yeah. I don't know. Is is the cost of capital going back to zero? So if we if we need to significantly increase production domestically, I don't see the capital structure in place that you're going to be able to do that because you're not going to be able to fund the production at the wells anymore. So, right. So you had a great financial crisis. Interest rates to, went to zero. All of a sudden. You could fund all this fracking activity for almost nothing, which leads to none of them actually ever earning their cost of capital back. But so, what are the implications of what you just laid out? So it's, I think it's it's tight supply for an extended period of time. So is that higher prices? Because at a certain point, when Saudi Arabia reaches the cap for another what million barrels no, per day, a lot more, a lot more. Yeah. Okay, Russia is basically at their cap. And here in the United States, we're prioritizing decarbonization. Unless you tell me the result of an election changes that, where does the extra supply come from? But, but it's more than that. Think about if-, if You always got to one-up me. Go ahead. Why well, has anything changed? It's the same thing for 20 years ago. Right? I'm sorry, I'm not a suit. I don't work for Virtus. Okay? I don't hedge my bets. I'm not on TV. Every- if, if 65% of our U.S. cars went electric vehicles, right? Because of what's going on in India and Africa, do you think our overall consumption of gasoline worldwide is going to go down in the next 10 years? No. That's right. We're point. just going to get replaced We're as gas replaced. consumers by them. Right, by, by them. Not only like that. Do you think how much more carbon efficient are we producing energy in this country than doing it in Africa? So now what we're doing is we're taking and saying, we don't want to produce it here. Not in, our, not in my backyard. But we're going to allow it to take place in Venezuela, Ghana. You see what's going on in Ghana? Ghana has the biggest... Um, Oil fine, there is you know, natural gas in, in the past 10 years. And they're just saying, boom. Think they're caring about the environment? No. Oh, so now I'm going to get someone from Ghana, Colombia. But, right? right? So what we're doing is, and, and what do we think? That if you pollute the environment in Africa or in, um, or in Central America, that's not going to affect us here? It's like, not only that, think about this. I was talking to a truck driver the other day. Yes, I am French. Okay. So- if, if, if electric vehicles and trucks, how far does a how far does a diesel truck go on a U.S. highway right now, Josh? How far? Yeah, how many, well, per uh, mile? No, on a full tank. Uh, I don't know, three hundred miles. Come on, what more or less? I'm gonna put you in a diesel thing with your friend here. You yeah, know? I've never I've never sat in a truck. About eight hundred fifty nine hundred miles. Oh, okay, I wasn't that far off. Just now, half. now if you just take by half. <laughs> He's not good at math either. I'm not gonna, that's, that's yeah. what happens when you come from Barrett. When you come from Barrett, like, but when you go ahead and you're in an electric vehicle diesel truck, you know, one of those trucks, how far does it go? Oh, I don't know. On, a, on one battery charge? 300 miles. Yeah. Means the same truck yeah. has to stop three times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right. Right? Yeah. Plus, nobody, it, to your point, it's not just the fact that nobody wants to work anymore. Nobody wants to work in the oil fields. Nobody wants to. What's the coffee shop down the block from we used to go to? Chateau? Chateau. Do you know uh, Chateau? Know Chateau, Chateau right? and Woodmere? Oh, I, got a, I got a mesh last week. Yeah. Okay, you know yeah. right? We call it Chateau. So I used to go there. I was in <laughs> I was in there seeing, I had to go to the doctor, see my mother. I was over there. Okay, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna go there, you know, have a you know, same breakfast. Yeah. It closed. Yeah. So finally open at eight o'clock. I go, what's the deal? Nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to be there. Nobody okay. wants to work. Well, I have had the I have had this uh I've had this epiphany. I had to drive to Newark Airport last week. My my daughter landed from from Europe. It took me three hours. I'm looking around on the roads in Long Island, Queens, to send me through Brooklyn, Lower Manhattan, North Jersey. Where, where are all these f-ing people going? It's Wednesday I at one o'clock. That. Why is nobody at work? It, I don't know. I really don't understand it, but I do understand it because people are just working from whatever they feel like. There's also more traffic because there's more accidents because everyone's looking at their phone. Boy, wins 10-10? That's, that's true. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> no, but 
are but you talking about? I was going to give you the point from before. I was going to admit I was wrong and give you the you point. You don't have to give you the point. But you know the other thing about this is all these transmission lines, people don't realize this. Forget about, I mean, I'm not, is you, you have to collect it, you have to connect the grid. So it goes by cables, right? You know, you know what the backlog is in those cables now? If you what, want to order to cables. Connect, to connect something to the to the utility. Yeah, right. okay. How long is it? How, to, to throw those cables. How much? How long the backlog is? I don't know. 17 Maybe. months. Try again. Okay. Four years. Four years. Okay. Where are we going? Yeah. All right. So you have a lot of factors that are going to keep supply of not just Can oil. Keep but demand. Keep demand high and keep supply low. Okay. Also, think about this. 15, 20 years ago, if you were a farmer and you and you and you uh, had wheat, corn, and soybeans, you were stuck, you know, selling it locally, domestically. Now, everyone tenders for it. Yeah, Africa, everyone, India, everyone wants it, right? Yeah. So, are we growing? Is the number? Is the amount of farmland? Is the amount of productivity raising that much that we're going to go ahead and offset this increase in demand? No. Right. How about if everyone's worried about the biggest commodity shortage? It's going to be water. You see what's going on with water, right? But no one can really trade water because there's no real way of- You can't trade it, but you can invest around water. Yeah, and it's again. probably in a portfolio, the most accessible commodity, but yet the most underinvested commodity is water. Okay, but if for people that are not as smart as Joe, again, because I don't know anything about stocks, to me, then we go back in, corn, soybeans, wheat. They all need water. They all need, water. It's, need water. it's an input to everything. Right? It's input to everything. Yeah, you're going to so run out of it. Right? Clean water too. Clean water, right? Okay. So. So structurally, you're you're bullish on commodities, not every day, every tick, but no. just yeah. generally speaking, it, we're not making more of these things. And think about this. If you're a stock investor, okay, what's the biggest hiccup you could possibly have? If there's a real water shortage, right? If, if food prices go through the roof, right? If heating oil prices and natural gas prices go through the roof, right? Yeah, so it, some it filters through to every to every right. company. So, so when you so when you when you buy car insurance, you buy car insurance because why you want to collect it, you buy it as a hedge. So most people who are listening to this, who are not commodity traders, should be looking at commodities as insurance. You buy it, you hope it goes nowhere, you don't make any money, and the rest of your portfolio does well. Because if if I guarantee you, if commodities go up a lot, you the stock market you're going to get killed. You yeah. see them as like uh, negatively correlated. Quite and long, yeah. Okay, let's do this, uh, John. Let's put gold up. Here we go. This is a mark. This is a piece of shit of an asset class. <laughs> that, why? Why isn't this three thousand? We printed so much money. Everyone all over the world. We flooded the economy with money. We had nine percent CPI last summer. Nine. Okay. Why is gold at eighteen, eighteen, nineteen hundred still? I have no idea. All right. So you don't have to answer <laughs> for it. But are you surprised by this? No, I have no idea. For as long as you've been trading futures, you've right. heard people say yes. gold is an uh, inflation hedge, right. and one day you'll see all this Fed shit is going to result in inflation. Right. Well, here it is, right. and gold is the same price it was in 2011. Right. That's, I mean, that's It's like, not an essential commodity. Though. I don't know. All the commodities- I don't are know either. I'm I don't just know. mystified by it. By the way, you may have just said it, but now that you just said it, probably go up $100 tomorrow, but I have no idea. <laughs> but all yeah. the commodities- I'm not sure. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> all the commodities he's talking about, agriculture, water, oil, yeah, natural they're gas, useful. they're essential commodities. Gold, it's not an essential commodity. Where and- I come from, it is. You know what's going to happen? <laughs> Where I come from, happen. it is. All the gold bugs, okay? Yeah. We just listen to what Joe just said. Yeah. Right? Oh, they're they're going to put that other thing. And watch, tomorrow morning you'll see uh, gold doing, you know, a uh, board apes thing and go up, and they'll yeah. blame it on Joe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I got two, I got two uh, Jewish American princesses in my house. I promise you gold is an essential commodity. Overall, though, to <laughs> from, his from, point, from commod- my well-being. commodities of portfolio insurance, think of it as crisis alpha. Okay. That's what it is. It's has crisis alpha. It, has, it has it acted that way? You know, gold went down on January 6th. I find it to be useless, honestly. I okay, hope, I hope but I'm you're wrong. focused on on gold. I'm thinking the the commodity complex itself. All right, John, wait, co- wait, copper. Wait, 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 before we go to copper, who cares about co- copper? <laughs> All right, wait, go, the go, copper back, chart go back to ags for a second. Ready? Okay, please. Anybody watch John Kerry last week on TV? When he, what are 33 percent of the world emissions, carbon emissions, come from where? China. What activity? Uh, uh, driving. Driving. What? I'll do this. Farming. Again. Mr. Mr. We're not that smart. We're not Mr. That smart. Mrs. Merrick. Yeah. Flying. Oh, yeah. What activity, according to John Kerry, I think this is right, accounts for 33% of the world emissions? Bitcoin mining. Food production. Okay. I I'll believe say that. farming. Okay. Farming. So what are you, you're going to put restraints on farming? You put restraints on farming. No. No, you can't, right? You lose, uh, you you lose, lose society. Right? You yeah. lose society. So think yeah. about 
Sugar's up thirty four percent this year. You long? Put this uh, put this weed put this weed chart up, John. <laughs> so then, so then, how do we how do we account for this? It's been pretty. It's been pretty rough. Yeah, but again, every time every time the consensus gets negative, like yeah. when the commitment of traders that Joe was talking about goes, sh- where the specs get out and go short, you want to close your eyes and buy it because okay. all these wheat, soybeans, corn. Soybean oil, right? It's the same thing. Do you know how much of the market is people like you versus the producers and like the people that need to hedge? No, I don't care. <laughs> how much of the activity that you're seeing on your screen is uh, algorithmic or software versus people placing bets? I don't know. Okay. Does it, has it changed the way? It has to have changed. So has it changed the way that you have to operate knowing that on the other side of a lot of stuff yeah, is just really a they're computer? More, they're, they're smarter people than more smart. They're more smart. There are many more smarter people than me out there. That's what but how much of what you do is models, mathematical models versus your we intuition? Do. We have we have algorithms that we that I create. Yeah. And is that a piece or all, or how no, does that a piece? No. So is that a separate piece or is that part of your the input to your process? A separate piece. Okay. Um, we have these charts, Mark. Here we I go sh- again. I want to show these to you. What charts are we there now? Uh, this is well. These are. What are you showing? I'm showing you stocks, but I know. I don't you- want to see. Talk to him. <laughs> about stocks. Uh, Joe, this is energy materials Here we go again. versus the S&P 500. How many times have you done this on okay. your show? 500? Uh, no. <laughs> no? How many times did you show a shot with these? Go ahead, go. Go ahead. Go. Is there, me- is there, meaning-, is there meaning when you see uh, energy materials? Uh, I guess this is year to date. We, got- we actually go back further. We can go five years. Is there meaning to you when you see this level of underperformance uh, through-, through half a year? in these areas of the market? Is there like a an economic read through or not necessarily? I, I don't I don't think I agree with that. I think that the market is taking in 2023 a a more offensive approach. Okay. And if the market is taking a more offensive approach, it immediately goes towards growth, immediately goes towards mega caps, it immediately goes towards technology. What's interesting is the uh, quarterly rebalance for the Joe T ETF just happened, okay? And I always say that tends to take the personality of the market. Dramatic increase in the weighting towards technology, dramatic increase in the weighting towards consumer discretionary, a less of exposure to the defensive areas like consumer staples and healthcare. What was interesting to me though is energy maintained its overweight allocation. So there's something there in not only the momentum aspect, but also the quality aspect for energy, that's kind of signaling to you that while the market looks more offensive in its nature, it still sees energy as particularly relevant in the conversation uh, for the way you're thinking about a portfolio. Because you're waiting on momentum, you're waiting on uh, quality. Yeah, those two factors. Uh, Can we talk about uh, Bill Ackman's tweet today? So. I don't really fully understand the mentality of putting on a trade and then tweeting it, but here we are. So I kind of agree with him, and I'm not a I'm not a global macro trader, and I'm not going to read this whole thing. What's the TLDR? The TLDR is if long term inflation is really going to be more like three percent versus two percent, uh, and history holds, we could see the thirty year Treasury yield go from three percent to five and a half percent, and it's breaking out right now. And Massive breakout. That's not it's how a market, huge breakout. That's not how markets trade. Okay, say more. What? Say more. Because <laughs> markets trade on perception of what's going to happen, not what really happens. So I think this is where the perception is shifting. Right. So again, he may affect perception. But yeah. Again, reality doesn't really matter if it's two or three. Does anyone really believe it's two or three? Nobody believes that inflation is is three is trending close toward three right now. Of course not. Right. No one even knows. I mean, th- th- these numbers are all made up. Okay. Right. Okay. You think that the you think that the numbers that come out, these labor numbers that come out with the adjustments and the and the and the, the birth death, they can make them, it's, it's a it's a right, it's a, it's a model. It's too many people to right. really track. It's perception. Yeah, yeah. What is the perception? The perception is we're going to have more inflation, right? Yeah. Right. So the perception is if there's if there's a jump more, then the then the bond's going to come. I mean, to some degree, the reason why stocks have gone up so much, right? Yeah. It's because would you rather put your money in a corporation or would you rather give it to the U.S. government the way things are going? John, throw up this positioning chart, the cl- the figure 12 client survey. Here we go. So, again. no, this is not What's a, this a figure is, this 12 is a sentiment. Client survey? Shush client for a second. Listen, your listen, clients? Listen, <laughs> listen. Are these your clients? Listen. Who, 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 is this Merrick? J.P. Morgan. <laughs> so, J.P. Morgan. This is the South Merrick uh, 
uh, bagel report. <laughs> this is now. Nah, this is an everything chart. All right. Their client survey indicates that long duration positioning is more widely held now than at any point over the last five to ten years. This came out like three or four days ago. Yeah. Then we saw uh, Fitch do what they did. Whatever. We can get into that. The downgrade. So people were so offside. So is is there like a reverse squeeze? Like people that were long duration are now getting out? No. The reason why that happens is because insurance companies have have the chance to lock in their their trades, right? If you're an insurance four, company, four percent yeah, right now, lock that, it in forever. Right? You think about all these people. Think about all the underfunded pension fund liabilities that are out there in the world, right? They were already zero. Now they can this lock helps. in four percent. This helps. Yeah. Right. How can they, you know? What am I, I again? I don't know what I'm talking about. Do you trade interest rates? Not no. Have you Have you ever? Sometimes. Okay. What What don't you like about that market? I don't or, understand it. Okay. No, I don't have an edge. Yeah. If you can have an edge, you're not going to trade it. Uh, this is pretty notable breakout though. Put up Put up the thirty year treasury rate. Here we go. Massive. Now, take a look at this. If this was a, uh, if this was natural gas or, or uh, corn or soybean, this is back to 1970. Hmm. Let's say 1977 or whatever. Uh, this is a pretty big breakout, or it looks looks as though it could be. Looks okay. as deceiving. Looks as deceiving. You know that. Okay. Choice. The okay. yield curve is uninverting rapidly, which is pretty interesting. Well, debt as a percentage of GDP is going to dis- explode, and you can't dismiss that. Okay, so Fitch did basically what S&P did back in 2011, right? Moody's is the only loan holdout, but are they wrong in what they did? Here's, well, what, they here's said. what they said. They said, the rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden and the erosion of governance reliance uh, relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades that has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last minute resolutions. Not entirely untrue, but these are the companies that have the AAA. We have AA. Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore, Australia are all rated higher than we are. Right. So if some shit blows up in the United States, Germany is not going to be a AAA credit. What? Every, everything on everything in this table is reliant upon the U.S. being a AAA credit in practice. Maybe not according to Abercrombie and I don't Fitch. Disagree but with, I don't disagree with like, that. Well, we have military protection for, for uh, two-thirds of the, of the countries listed on this table. I, so if we're not AAA, then none of them can really be AAA. Well, I, the only thing that I see in the last couple of days that's different than 2011, because that's the template, right, is what happened to Treasury yields. In 2011— They went down, right? Treasury yields went down yeah. Yeah. because the equity market went down. This feels a little different because the equity market went down and Treasury yields are actually going up. Yeah. So there's something there. They were positively correlated all last year, there's which something, is what killed there, portfolio managers. Right. So there, there's something there that is disconcerting uh, to the bond market for sure. This is Goldman Sachs's response. We do not believe there are any meaningful holders of treasury securities who will be forced to sell due to a downgrade. S&P downgraded the sovereign rating in 2011. While it had meaningful negative impact on sentiment, there was no forced selling at that time. On the other hand, if Japan goes ahead and gives up yield control, Right, and they start selling U.S. bonds. They'll blame Fitch for the reason why they're doing it. Okay, that's right. interesting. Right? Uh, do you think those two things, what's going on with the currency in Japan and Fitch's announcement, are completely detached from each other, or maybe connected in some way? No idea. Okay, but I will. T- you know, one thing about you said about, about defense. The one thing I do that catches my eye again, I'm not stocks. Is every day after the close, you see uh, Lockheed Martin was just granted a. Two trillion dollar contract from this one. This one was in all those non competitive bids. To me, with the state of the world, how could you, you know? I, I'm not asking you this one. How could you not be long defense stocks? They're, oh, I am. Like, I totally agree. It's with an old that. guy. And every day after the close, they read another thing two billion dollars, 17 billion dollars. I don't even know what the, you know, and now that all this armament's been used in Ukraine, they're going to have to restock, right? Yeah. Right? I think, a, I think there's no, yeah. I think there's no end in sight uh, no for, end. for the foreseeable future for the rearming of the world and plus think about this if nobody wants to be in the army that means you need more more material material because if yeah. there's less people right uh J- joe can we talk about uh can we talk about joe t uh third anniversary this fall sure okay first of all congratulations thank you i remember when you launched the etf you came on my other podcast my original podcast what happened to that one uh we turned it into this this is more fun Okay. This is what we do with other people live. So uh, three years running the ETF, what was the biggest surprise in all that time that you weren't prepared for? Or, uh, you know, upside surprise or downside surprise? Or what What would you say is the thing that happened that you weren't expecting? I, th- I think the hardest thing, 
is the blessing and the curse of CNBC. Okay. So the blessing being- We're going to edit out the curse part. <laughs> so the blessing being, no, we, 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 we're going to speak towards the curse. So the blessing being, being on CNBC, CNBC has been wonderful, yeah. remarkable, and affording me the opportunity to explain the strategy. Yep. Everyone across the board. And the other, you know, my colleagues, my panelists, they've all been receptive in that nature. The problem is being on CNBC, everyone takes the strategy and measures you versus the, the S&P 500. Yeah, you have a public track record. That's it. Yeah. You're, you're measured against the S&P 500. And upon inception of the strategy, what this was, was to take a single factor of momentum, which I felt was deficient in, in providing an investor a real mitigated risk opportunity to invest in momentum itself, yeah. right? And it's not being measured in the right way. That's the that's the challenge. This How do you really want to be is it's it's an improvement over a single factor of momentum, without question. It's adding upon it the quality factor, adding upon it You're, a right. look so, at a fundamental right. so wanna, balance sheet. So you want to be looked at as like, okay, you want to invest in momentum, fine. Do it this way with a quality screen. Absolutely. So you're not just buying the momentum of junky stocks. Okay. It's, it's a shock absorber. So that that's the biggest. So people have trouble. People have trouble with that, right? Because everything's measured against the S and P, which is fine. Well, is, I mean, this is this is this is well, life. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Let, what it let is. me give you some love, Joe. You have Joe T. The ETF has destroyed the biggest momentum ETF in the United States, I believe, which is M two M, right? The iShares product. M2, so M T U M. M T U M. You have destroyed it since inception. Three years. Uh, you've just you've just crushed. So. Credit to you. Congrats. And people say, Congrats. why does that matter? Congratulations. Thank that you. Matters. People say, why does that matter? Because there's billions of dollars yeah. that's invested in a single factor of momentum. Yeah. Um, so listen, I'm very satisfied in that we've improved upon that factor of momentum. Well, I'm, pr I'm proud of you. Thank I, you. I believed in you. Just, Thank you. Just like I appreciate set, set the record straight. I knew you would do it. I didn't know why or how. There are a lot of differences between how you're managing your ETF versus how other people do momentum. Mm -hmm. Forget about the other ETF, but just generally- a lot of people have different definitions for momentum, and a lot of people are not even doing it scientifically. They're just like, I trade momentum. What does that mean? I don't know. Stock's going up, I buy it. Stock's going down, I sell it. Uh, you have a process, and I think that that puts it a big step forward versus a lot of other stuff out there. And we're focused first and foremost on risk. So we're equally weighted. We're not market cap weighted, right? Okay. We don't want the idiosyncratic single stock event risk. So you don't want NVIDIA becoming 13, 14% of your portfolio? No. no. Everything is all about risk. Okay. Mark, how do you think about momentum and, and trend in, in your industry? Believe it or not. Do commodities yeah. trend or do they mean oh, reverse? They definitely trend. Both, yeah, they, right? They, both they do both. Yeah. Believe it or not, I do believe like I'm an index, we have an index called the Essential 40, which basically is equally weighted as well. We rebalance, which is based on essential stuff. It's not momentum at all, right there. But again, if you don't rebalance, right? It, it, you know, it, 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 to me, that's a much safer way to invest in, than not rebalancing. But I want to digress for one second. I was talking something that I wanted to you before. We talk about traders, right? What makes a good trader? What makes a good trader also knows you got to start all over, right? If you're in a bad way, you're in a bad streak, things aren't going right, just start all over. And we just saw it happen in the last 72 hours. Josh, tell me who you saw it happen. Somebody started all over? Started all over. And one of the best traders said, Come on, give me a hint. No, baseball. No, baseball. Stevie Cohen started all over again. That is, oh. that is impossible to do. Not impossible. He did it. Very hard. He did yeah, it. Well, he can afford to do it. Though. I'm not yeah. saying that, but think yeah. about what that means. Is boom. Blank slate. You know, remember Bobby Fischer? You ever see searching for Bobby yeah, Fischer? Yeah. The guy takes a picture, he's like, booms. Start all over? Yeah. As a trader, you need to be able to do that and be humble enough to say, screw it. You can't over. always fix what's wrong. Just Sometimes you just need a clean slate. Clean slate. Oh, I think that's a great lesson. It doesn't always apply, but when it does, it really right. does. Just sell everything. Start over. Start, start fresh. Just not sell, just yeah. start all over. Right? Yeah. Take a couple days. Just start. You know over. why that's so? You know why that's so, so important? Like in in surgery, they, if a if a if if a surgeon makes a mistake, they don't let the surgeon go in there and fix his own mistake. They bring somebody else in, brand new. Start all over. Here's the problem. Right. Beca because the, the the goal is keep the patient alive, not to button up an old error. So if you have a situation where nothing's going right, maybe that's like a really great lesson is just say, I got I gotta I gotta start from from clean. I have a, I have a question. How many people are actually gonna listen to this podcast? 
What do you think? Like a lot. A lot 50,000? Yeah. 75? I, mean, I don't know. I think 50,000 people will download it and another, I don't know, twenty five to 50,000 will Not watch it. Not to tell you how to run your business, but I would love somebody yeah. to do a study. Right? You guys can do it because you, you don't. I can say you don't give so good. Someone needs to run a poll, right? Because mm. there's, there's a reason for this. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, none of the above. Who wins? Everyone knows the answer to that. Really? I, I don't think my audience is representative of the whole country, though. No? No. I think there's a lot of people in my I mean, audience that above, care most about— None of the above about, gets at least 25% of the vote. I think none of the above wins. Uh, I think none uh, of the above wins, too. How many elections have there been in our lifetimes that none of the above wouldn't have won? No. Obama, Bush? Not much. I think now it's none of the above in, in a landslide. Right? I'm curious. That's what I'm saying. You should, someone should do it. I would tell you this. But you guys, you guys are out of the box enough. You should do it. I know it's hard. Those, those comments would be really fun. Yeah, <laughs> we should do that just right. for the engagement. None of the above. Can we? And can we just finish the thought for a second on? Steve I can't because my my ADD <laughs> okay. kicked in. So I'll do it. I'll do it. That's an impressive. I'll do it with Josh. Right. That's impressive. <laughs> Think about the embarrassment, right? So the exercise of wiping the slate clean, yeah. stopping yourself out as a trader, Stevie Cohn, right? So highly successful. Think about wiping away that embarrassment, the courage that it takes, the discipline it takes on his part. I just think it's remarkable that he was able to execute and move like that when- Dude, he's the owner. But you're, you, it's, it, the whole city is looking at It would be impressive if him. it was a GM working for him that pushed him to do it and didn't lose his job. He owns the team. No, I disagree. The Josh, courage. Because the players are his public stock calls. It's hard to turn that shit around. That's well, it's easy when you look at how they're doing. No, no. Nah. No. No. I mean, All right, are Mets fans like, don't do that? Come on. The, I, but owners get married to their players. I think it's smart what he's doing. I don't think it's courageous. Oh, it's it's it's. But it's, it's his own money. He's wiping away the embarrassment. Yeah. Well, he said, "All right, you're right. I should say that. You're right. He's admitting whatever shit I've been doing for three years is not good. Right. Okay. So yeah, uh, I think what's different about this and and SAC, he didn't have to do that with any trades at SAC. He wasn't talking publicly about trades that he was in. And uh, maybe he did that more times than that most make, people that think. That makes it even harder to do sometimes. What? What's that? Doing it qu quietly? Yeah. Privately? Okay. Maybe, yeah, who knows? You invented uh, You invented a new type of hurricane window. What? What? Yeah, he did. Yeah. What'd you do? We have pictures of this. John, on screen, please. Oh, don't show this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to show this. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's Is that a traitor? Hold no, on. that's not a traitor. <laughs> Give me volume. Do we have volume on this? or? So I live in Miami. Okay, hurricane, which is gonna, you know, with all the, uh, with. You got like five years left. Probably. You're gonna have to put it on stilts. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. coming back to Long Island. My weather guys say that the, the probability of a Hurricane Ian hitting Miami in the next 10 years is 75%. Okay. Okay. With that being said, everyone has the sliding glass doors, right? The apartments, everything else. Yeah. And no one really realizes until you, it's too late that the water, when, 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 when when water hits your tracks, normally the water comes in and out through these like little weep holes. I know this firsthand because we have this problem in my house. That's what it is. And so when a, when, but when a storm comes, the wind and water hit the track. It can't go back and forth. It goes into your residence, gets into your sheetrock, gets into your old thing, and that's how it creates chaos. All right? And there was during Hurricane Irma, there was hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to everyone's apartments because of this. So the, in my house in Miami, this happened. I'm saying someone's got to figure out how to figure out to solve this problem. So me, uh, the largest home builder in the uh, state of Florida, Todd Glazer, two of my good friends, we all came up with and figured out how to do this. So we came up with a solution, how to fix this problem. Okay, and my partner said, let's go and file for a patent. Not to get a patent, just to see the competition. Lo and behold, we got a patent. No one's ever done it. And now we partnered with a large, a very large window manufacturer, the publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange called Technoglass. And the symbol is TGLS. You can look at their stock price. They're, they're, they're kicking ass, right? I don't know, right? And we're about to uh, roll this out all through the state of Florida. But basically, this is going to save you from having about 95, 98% of the water that normally would get in, you know, not getting into your house. Think about it. Because all the damage happens not from the, the wind and water. I'm not on the first floor I'm talking about. From the second floor, it happens from under the tracks. It goes right through the tracks. That's how you get all the mildew. That's how you get all the mold. So that's the it. water gets trapped in the tracks. And then, that you and then overwhelms the tracks. Yeah, then yeah, overwhelms yeah. the tracks, goes into your apartment, and that's the end of it.
and then it's mold, and then it's- And then it becomes right. chaos. So the insurance companies in a place this. like Florida, which they this. don't even want to insure there right. anymore anyway. Right. Think but about how much is, insurance has gone up in Florida. It's gone up 70% year over year. Yeah. You know, if someone wants to take the other side of, you know, the real estate market in Florida, it's because of the insurance cost. Right. Okay. So this, so this is something that you seem to be really excited about. So- what what involvement are you going to have? Are you just guys going to let them take no, it away, no, do what they do? No, we we we, we license to them, and, and they're a really great partner, Stormer. But what yeah. we did also, what we did with them is, what, so, so Josh, if you buy a system for your house, right, hopefully at some point you're going to get an insurance credit that's going to offset it. Yeah. But secondly, for everyone you buy, every system you buy, which is like, a, let's say a couple windows, we donate one to people who can't afford it. So oh, wow. People, right? So basically people that can't afford this, right, you're paying for it. We're all paying for it, which is because this is too big of a problem. Oh, because the insurance companies are paying for it. Therefore, it shows up in our premiums no, anyway. Right, but I'm saying, but for people who don't even have insurance, you know. These yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Right, so that's really the. So what's the innovation? Is it the glass or the housing that's holding the glass? Like what? Just put, now you can put it on. You'll all see right. how simple this is. I mean, people right. take sandbags, you know, put it on. That never works. Think about if you're on the 10th floor, right? And you think, and you put sandbags outside. Which is, I mean, how do you get back in the apartment? Okay, so helicopter. So, so he's showing. He's showing. This is like the original one because we made it much better. But he'll show you. So he pulls the head. Okay. Uh, if he ever stops clicking it. All right, hold on. Let's take 10 seconds. He, it's a thumb screw. And he puts it. Here he goes. Right on the track. Oh, look at this. Right? Oh, so, so you right? could just install this on existing. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look and this, this is going to block. This is going to block the water. This and some tape on the inside that we do. We tested it already. We tested it at one of the big hurricane centers in Miami. There you go. Boom, this and tape on the inside box 99. And look, and the beauty of it is you can still get in and out of your unit because it doesn't stop you from getting in and out of your unit. So you were, just, were you just, shocked that something so simple has not- Right, it comes out to keep it simple, oh. stupid. How about the guy who made uh, Post-its? How much money that guy so made? So wait, what do you do? You just step over this thing? Yeah. Or you take it off yeah. whenever you want? Yeah. Okay. You take it off before, you put it on before a storm, you take it off after. So you don't, if you, you take it, it on- It looks like off. he installed this thing in two seconds. Exactly. Okay. It's moronic proof. I love, hey, I love it. I love what's, it. The replace, oh, what's the replacement on this? How many years? Can five that years. Five years. So that's great. You don't want to make the replacement too long. You, you can't because it's plastic. But you want to sell it again. Of course we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm with you. I'm, All still, right. I'm still I like it. I like it. Right? All right. Did you have fun on the show today? Did you have fun? I had fun. Joe always has fun. Well, no. What about you? Did you have fun? Yeah. I know he had fun. You two merit boys. Uh, yeah, I didn't true. know he worked at Mateo's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, Michael. He, to, he was in the prom with my son in the <laughs> car. Yeah. God only knows what went on that car, but so that's all, a size. We're all, uh, we're, all South, we're all South Shore boys. Right? Yeah. Amazon uh, beat the shit you, out of earnings. Yeah, I see that. Uh, there do, we go. Do you miss it? Do you miss it? Miss what? Uh, Long Island. No. You're done. I, 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 we have an apartment in the middle of it, but I don't miss it. So I don't know if Mike knows this. Uh, my kid plays AAU basketball, travel basketball, and we play tournaments during the course of the season and league and regular league play. And all the games are at Island Garden. Right. And your name is all over the building. Right. But I don't own Island Garden. Jim Fox oh, runs. But, okay. But we used to, I ran but what the, was your involvement? Were you like- I the, ran, I owned it. You, you owned, did own it. But all okay. the not-for-profit stuff, you know, I'm, you know we- we were we, Jim's program, uh, Dana Dingo's program, all those. We, the idea is how many kids get, can get to college for free. Yeah. And since we've been involved, I think we've gotten over. This is the Long Island Lightning. Right. Long Island Lightning, New York Lightning. Okay. Uh, so we play you guys. We're a, we're a program called Level Up. We play light, light, We play against five different Lightning teams every season. But you season. don't play the New Heights Lightning. New Heights Lightning is the real deal. That's a team that went to EBL. That's like a yeah, no, no, no. Team. My kid's not on a team that plays the real deal. Let's just <laughs> there's a kid in our, there's let's a kid establish that. that. There's a kid in the team that's going to play point guard for North Carolina. Yeah. Jordan Dingle just transferred from Wharton to play point guard for St. John. Uh, point, you know, these kids are- Real you know, players. Real players. So when you're- so, so you, so you must have put a lot of time and effort into that back when- Not as, not as much as I used to. But now yeah. my focus is on, because of my little one, is baseball and Hialeah. That's the next- Okay. Because that's another whole- Do you have that personality where you can't get halfway into something? You just like- What do you think? It seems like you do. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. okay. So you're going to go You're gonna go all in and start building baseball fields and turf and all this stuff? I, or I, building leagues? Or helping kids. Helping kids. Right? That's okay. what's helping yeah, I kids. I love that. I love that. Well, we, uh, on behalf of everyone here at the compound, we want to thank both you guys for coming. We had a great, we had a great time with you. Uh, we do this thing to end every show called favorites. And we're basically going to ask you to tell the audience something that you're watching or reading or listening to or whatever, anything that you think other people should hear more about. Michael, do you want to go first? Uh, 
I'm excited. Well, that's not a fit. Well, I guess it is. I'm, I'm excited to see Metallica tomorrow. That's that's how I'm finishing is, my week. Is it MSG? No, MetLife. MetLife. Oh, wow. You're going out there for yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of, yeah, I know. All right. I'm All excited. Right. Uh, What's wrong? You made a face. What's wrong with Metallica? What kind, what, kind of music, what kind of music would you go to Giant Stadium for? I wouldn't go to Giant Stadium. What are you, uh, a Barry Manilow guy? Me, me no. Come clean. No. Come clean. No. Did you go to Taylor, Taylor Swift with your daughter? She didn't want to go. She's aged out. She's 17. She's uh, I I got I, I got lucky with that one. Oh, you got lucky. Yeah, yeah. You went. Why did you go? Remy went. I would, of dude. I would have gone if Remy she was went. like. I took I took her to everything. I took her to Lil TJ at uh in in Huntington. I took her to Drake. I took her to Migos. Don't get, don't get defensive. No, <laughs> gladly though. Anything she wanted to do. Mark I is would, a seventies disco guy. Okay. Mess, what are you? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, favorite? You got a favorite for us? Lone you, Survivor. What is it? Oh, I love that movie. Lone Survivor. I, saw, watched I feel the, like I saw watched that. the movie the other day. Mark so, Wahlberg. Yeah. So my middle son Tanner is playing this year hockey for the Long Island Goals. Mm. They have a big emphasis on teamwork, military training. Uh, Lone Survivor is a fantastic movie. So he starts training camp at the end of August, and Mike Murphy, who unfortunately lost his life in Afghanistan, is part of the Lone Survivor story. Mike Murphy's uh, family will come and address the players before that. Oh wow! It's just it's just a remarkable movie and a great reminder of the sacrifice yeah. that people make in this country. Joe, right. did you see the Covenant? I did not. The Covenant is Guy Ritchie came out last year with Jake Gyllenhaal, or this year maybe. It was awesome, 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 awesome war movie. Okay, uh, Mark, you got a favorite for us? Yes. Tell hit me. Oppenheimer. Oh, I saw it. But for a reason. Okay, what, why do you think it's I want to hear. No, I want to hear what you think. Really? He didn't like it. I, I sort of liked it. There's I want to hear what you think. There's one that I don't think you guys realize. Give it to me. In the movie, it's discussed that Germany and Hitler were ahead of the United States in, the, in, nu in this whole nuclear plan. But Hitler was so against the Jews and the physicists were all Jewish yeah. that he didn't really put the effort into it that he could have because he didn't trust the Jewish physicists. Mm. If he would have trusted Jewish physicists, we'd all be German. Mm. So that, that's why. That's interesting. And they were, why were they all communists? Was, that I part know, I didn't really understand. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. But they spent like a third of the movie on communist stuff. I thought it was going to be more about World War II. You know? Okay, so write you, a review. What do no, I No, I'm not. <laughs> like, I know you didn't make the movie. I just, I just thought that part was weird. Did right. you like the movie overall? Yes. You did. Yeah. Uh, the performance is really good. What's his name? It's unbelievable. Killian Murphy was incredible. Oh, unbelievable. He was incredible. He's yeah. so, why did you like the movie? The last 45 minutes was way too long. Mike but and I it said just dragged. if I could sit through a three hour movie with my ADD, could, you could sit through. We saw it at IMAX dread on the gigantic screen. Wait, in Westbury? No, uh, Lincoln Center. Uh, Link, Lincoln Square. Here? Yeah, 10, yeah. 10 story screen. And it was, uh, listen, I like You guys the, went together? Yeah. That's a little strange. It's no, 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 no. <laughs> we, there was somebody else there. There was somebody else there. You went to uh, us <laughs> <laughs> see, you guys can play our, the same game I can play. It was our, it was our chaperone. All right. All but right. wait, before yeah. we get out of here, can we settle something? What? Last time I was on the show, we talked about we're, we're favorite. We're settling beefs now? Yeah, we are. Okay. Favorite Italian restaurant on Long Island. I went 388. He went Mateo's. My, my wife's going there tonight. 388? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's good. I didn't say it's not good. No, you went Mateo's over my 388. I've never been to 388. Which one's better? 388. 388. Like, no hesitation. Hands down. 388. Okay. All right, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe. I'm not, I mean, I, what do I know? I'm a, I'm a yeah, bad yeah. food You critic. apparently know a lot. What am I talking about? <laughs> okay, that's a wrap. <laughs> What's the best Italian food in Miami? Uh, Where do you go when you're homesick? Where I do don't you... really go anywhere. No? No. Okay. I go to the Palm. It's two blocks from my house. Do so right. you miss the pizza in New York? Yes. Yeah, you must, right? Yeah. What else? Chinese food? No, I need Chinese food. Favorite pizzeria in New York? What? Favorite pizzeria in New York? Gino's. Gino's. All right. I, he likes Ancona's, but I, it's... All right. All right. Well, fellas, you've uh, you've been amazing. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Thank uh, you, Josh. Thank reminder you, to all Compound listeners, make sure if you love the show, leave us a rating, leave us a review, any podcast platform that you're listening on, but really specifically try to do that on Apple or, uh, or Spotify. It goes a long way. Tell the algorithms that you love the show. Special thanks to Mark Fisher. Special thanks to Joe Terranova. Uh, great job this week, everyone. John, welcome back. Great job, Duncan, uh, Nicole, Rob, uh, Sean. I know you're out there. Thank you so much for all your help. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Take us out of here. <laughs>